the, the director Stefano Albertini to having me here again after my fellowship as a visiting professor in 2008, uh, an experience I'm very, I, which I very, very uh, fond uh, memories. Uh, as uh, Professor Albertini has uh, uh, began to say, it, I think it's very hard, uh, difficult to miss the fact that uh, food is so important in Italian American uh, identity and life. If not for anything else, because the American popular culture uh, reminds us that uh, so often and so significantly from, from film uh, to TV shows, uh, commercials and whatnot. But it also is the voice uh, of the community itself that is very much clear about uh, uh, emphasizing that idea. Um, in Italian American literature, from novel, from the poetry, memoirs, autobiographies, uh, there's always these strong uh, ideas, these strong notions that uh, uh, food is a very significant definer of the Itali Italian-American uh, experience. So my book uh, uh, basically uh, tries to uh, uh, answer the question why. I'm a historian, so I wanted to uh, find out about the historical dynamics that uh, make uh, food so important in Italian-American life and identity again. Uh, also, actually, this was originally my PhD dissertation, so I had uh, another broader goal in mind, um, which is, which was the, to uh, explore uh, how uh, minorities, uh, immigrant, diasporic groups uh, create, shape uh, their identity, with what kind of materials, what kind of narratives. And this seemed to me uh, a perfect case studies to explore that. So after this long journey, because the book uh, took uh, uh, um, a, a, a few years uh, to be researched in Britain, what I found out, I think two, two major things. One is that uh, Italian-American food culture is much uh, less uh, a persistence of all the traditions that uh, <laughs> the immigrants defended from uh, uh, modernity and the, the, the transfer from a rural to a, to a urban society, and uh, much more a very uh, their very creative response to the to the needs, uh, the challenges, and the psychological and material stresses that they have to uh, cope with, uh, experience in their migration and settlement uh, uh, process. So. Basically, in the book, uh, I look at them uh, uh, less as uh, cultural conservative and more as creative innovators, even inventors. I think that, that this is an important story to tell because in the uh, literature on consumer culture and consumerism, uh, most often scholars and writers insist on the middle class, people with uh, you know, disposable money with which they shop and they construct themselves. We have a group, in the book I talk uh, uh, mostly about um, immigrants coming to the United States, to New York, most especially uh, between the, the, the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the, the time of so-called mass Italian migration to the United States, which ended with an immigration law tailored on, on uh, uh, on Italians and Jews uh, attending their, their immigration. So it is an important day uh, to remember. Um, so these people, with, uh, as we know, uh, many of them were illiterate, most of them were poor, most of them come from uh, uh, some of the most backward um, countryside in Italian Europe, created a, a, a culture, uh, a, also material world, that was important for them to uh, cope with the, the new reality. The second point is that this mostly symbolical cultural construction would not that be tenable and probably would not have survived if it was not all, also very important in economical terms. Uh, if there was not uh, a group uh, of um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, merchants, vendors of, of any level that a, he provided uh, the, the, the Italian community with sufficiency in terms of, of the food, the stuff with which this culture is uh, nurtured and, and could thrive, but also very significantly um, 
created this very strong idea, the very strong connection between shopping Italian and being Italian. If, if you wanted to be Italian in America, Italian in New York, uh, you had uh, to consume uh, the products of this very important uh, uh, business community of Italian Americans involved uh, in, in the food business. Again, at any level. Um, um, so there, there is this important fact that I, I think it's important to, to um, um, think about, uh, also in terms of the size of the market that Italians in New York uh, uh, created at the beginning of the 20th century. At the 1930 uh, census in the city of New York, there were more than one million Italians. That, that means that one every six New Yorker was Italian, either first or second generation. The fact that these people continued to consume a la Italian meant that this market was very, very significant. In fact, uh, in, um, in my book, uh, uh, I focus on a particular area of Manhattan, East Harlem, uh, 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 a section of Oakton Manhattan that uh, since the, the, the 50s and 60s have been uh, known mostly as Spanish Harlem or Barbario, but in the 1920s and 30s was home of some 80,000 first and second generation Italian American. The um, largest uh, Italian hemisphere uh, uh, and club in the entire Western Hemisphere. So in a, in a few square blocks, a, a, a huge population of Italians, immigrants and their children uh, live. So again, we're talking about uh, a big market. So what I, what I want to do actually in the limited time that I have is uh, to illustrate, I, 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 I don't even try to talk about uh, the book, because that's too much. I, uh, my more limited goal is to talk about the first two chapters, and I leave to you to uh, read and, and, and explore the, 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 the following four. Uh, I want to talk about part of the book, let's say so, uh, using some of the illustration in the book. There's a section of illustration in the middle of the book. And I will start with the cover art. Okay? So this is a, a painting titled Family Supper by uh, uh, Italian-American artist Ralph Zanello, which is on the cover of the book. Uh, Ralph Zanello was a self-taught uh, uh, artist. He was born in 1914 in the Bronx, grew up in the Italian section of the village right here, uh, and lived most of the rest of his life in East Harlem because after World War II he bought a gas station there. Uh, he was recognized as an artist very late in life. Um, uh, so basically, um, another important point uh, to understand about uh, uh, Rafa Zanella is <coughs> that he was also a very progressive man. Uh, I would define him, define him as socialist. He, he worked for the union, for electrical union, for uh, uh, three decades, uh, uh, he fought in the Spanish Civil War with the Lincoln Brigade. Uh, I mention this because he, he, he could not be understood as being a supporter of unbridled capitalism or uh, uh, consumerism or hedonism. Yet, this image is, a, is an image that celebrates a certain kind of materialism. There's a lot of Things here, right? But first of all, this is an image of working class life. Why is working class life? Uh, in the very dedication uh, that uh, Fasanella made for this painting, right here on this barrel full of ice, he dedicated uh, the painting, this work, to his father, Joe. And this is the dedication. In memory of my father, Joe, the poor bastard died broke, and to all Joe's, that you say, broke. <laughs> and here's Joe. Joe is on the cross. <laughs> With this ice cart here, the ice barrel here, the hook that he used to uh, carry the ice. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's basically is a martyr on the cross of John, of our demanding memoir. Okay? But there is another person here, another subject who is also on the cross at the very center of this community, and is a mother. <laughs> the mother is crucified, but there's a saint, and she's a, the uh, caregiving, nurturing saint. She's the mother who holds the children to her breast. 
And the model is also here at the center of this scene. Here we have uh, uh, Sunday dinner, which is uh, the ritual of the community of the family. All, all, everybody is around the table. See, uh, even their expression is uh, convey the fact that this, this scene is sacred, not only the, these two holy uh, persons, okay? And what, what is the, how is the, this communi communion celebrated? With the consumption of food, but not any food, but Italian food. The cheese, uh, olive oil, vinegar, uh, fruit, wine, canned tomatoes, and so on, the cookies, the pasta. Um, so you have, you know, the entire, this, this idea of uh, abundance, of food at the service of the, of the creation of this idea of the home of the family. But what uh, Rafa Zanella does here is this, uh, you know, the uh, middle class family would emphasize family values in, a, in the dimension of the privacy? No, because Rafa Zanella, this is very typical of, the, of his uh, uh, work, he cuts away the front and the back of this tenement apartment. So the rest of the community, the other families, who supposedly share the same culture also because the, 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 the boundaries between public and, uh, private and public are so um, thin or non-existent, can look into the house. And the last, uh, I think, important factor is that this blending between the home and the street uh, is made even more evident because the, the, the streets are so lively because of what? Italian food stores. Charles Russo Meats, uh, Sam Sasso Bakery, and so on and so forth. Interesting, so you have these uh, you know, people here, the sidewalks full of people because of this. Uh, these food businesses actually support the entire uh, construction of the Italian uh, family and all. So I found this, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, very interesting, uh, um, this very close relation between uh, the two uh, dimensions, the cultural and the economic of the material. Now, I think to appreciate uh, the work of uh, uh, cultural construction that the immigrants did, we have to start with the immigrants. So, this particular image is not in the book, uh, but, but is in every or 90% of the textbooks of Italian history. Uh, usually you have half a page, one page, uh, that Italian history textbook uh, uh, dedicate, I'm talking about the textbook for the high schools, for example, dedicate to Italian mass migration that is almost invariably this image. A picture that um, one of the godfather of social photography, Louis Hine, took uh, with the Chicolones uh, family at Ellis Island in 1907, the year of the peak year of, immig of Italian immigration in the United States. Why is so image so iconic? I think some of the idea that uh, uh, this image uh, uh, conveys is that Italian were, were not, uh, uh, you know, there was a strong negative perception of Italians at the time. They were needed because of their labor was needed, but they um, were very much looked upon because were poor, were illiterate, <laughs> were Catholic. Uh, something that also this image partly tells us is that also they were considered uh, very much prolific at the time. Uh, a number of reasons. They were very familiar with the functioning of democracy, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think uh, first we can easily understand that this is rural people just by looking at the uh, face skin of the matter, which is scorched by the sun. This is a woman who worked uh, in the field. She probably looks a little older than she really is. But the, the, the point I'm very interested in is that uh, something that this e image betrays, this is a family most probably is rejoining an adult male who is already in New York, is that uh, uh, until World War I, uh, Italian migration was mostly a single man migration. Immigrants were men. In 1907, actually, 
almost 70 percent of the Italian immigrants were men, were men. So that, that creates uh, created not only for the people on the move, mostly men, but even for the people left behind in their own village, a uh, new kind of transnational life in which people uh, were abroad, people were on the move, uh, families were severed, uh, relations were strained. You, you didn't know what your husband was doing in a maid. Maybe he was you know, with another woman, never to return. He died in a mine. You, know, you don't know. And the men did not know what their, their wives actually did back in Sicily, Calabria, Basilicata, or whatever. Uh, so it was a, an extremely, a situation of extremely, uh, of very significant stress, uh, material and psychological. The social goal of the immigrant, uh, most specifically of the men, of the men, was come here, work, send money back, and then buy a house and some land uh, uh, back in their own bias, okay? Uh, so, but even when they arrived here, and settled in places like uh, Elizabeth Street, uh, Mulberry Street, Mott, uh, or uptown to uh, in Harlem, uh, they had to experience with uh, a family life with, with a, a far cry from what uh, Fasanella just showed us. Uh, they take in border, if they're men, they live together as borders, five, 10, uh, 12 in, a, in, a, in an apartment. Uh, Nuclear families live together, brothers and sisters with their with their with their spouses and so on and so forth. Uh, so it was, you know, um, very different at, 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 um, uh, at the time of their arrival, their family life for a number of reasons. And what about uh, their food, their diet? When they were in their uh, uh, native villages and in small towns, uh, they basically relied on a diet that the, the two main uh, um, pillars, let's say so. First there was everyday diet. It was, that was a diet extremely monotonous, mostly made on cereals. In the north they ate corn milk polenta, in the south they ate black bread with uh, any kind of flour basically uh, uh, baked. Uh, uh, in bread, uh, and uh, a little complement of animal protein like pork, uh, some cheese, uh, uh, salted fish, not much more than that. But then there was another parallel diet. There was the, the diet of the, the cooking of the special occasions, of festive days, of the, uh, the life cycle, uh, the wedding, the baptism, uh, even the funerals, uh, and Christmas Easter, the, 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 the patron saint day, and so on and so forth. Then there was an extremely fragmented culinary universe, very much differentiated uh, from town to town. Even uh, you know, neighboring town had their own uh, their own tradition. And there was the resembling this. There was the the the, uh, the diet of the rich. Uh, for example, white bread and also beef were food that were completely basically uh, reserved for the rich of uh, the país. Not only what they ate, but also how they ate was, was very uh, different, again, from Fasanella uh, image. Uh, there was not a time uh, to have uh, dinner, because these people lived mostly according to the natural time of the sun and the season and so, and so forth. There was not a specialized place where to have dinner. Uh, usually there was a single place in the house, uh, a board would, would be uh, taken out to, to trestle, and the board would be uh, set on the trestle, and the and the meal would uh, would happen. Most of the time, men sit and women stand, stood. Uh, and finally, technology. Technology was uh, uh, quite primitive in, in the peasant house. Uh, these people put on on a, on a, on a fireplace. There was uh, uh, let alone gas uh, or, or electricity, but most of the time, basically, uh, always. Uh, nor any water. So, what happened? What happened when they finally arrived to New York in terms of the encounter uh, with uh, the American market? Because ma the market was the most important uh, uh, factor in the encounter uh, in the city. Basically, what just happened in the United States in the two last uh, decades of the 19th century 
was the, that the industrialization of the production, processing, transportation, uh, distribution, and market of food, in which uh, the United States pioneered over the rest of the world in that city. Um, think of the uh, Chicago slaughterhouse, the refrigerated car, and so on and so forth. And, uh, a first uh, most significant consequence, the fact that the price for a number of food, most food, uh, eggs, uh, uh, beef, pork, uh, uh, flour, you name it, butter, declined extremely, very, very significantly in the last two decades of the 19th century. So the same dollar bought three times, uh, three times beef or three times eggs or three times butter than 20, uh, years uh, uh, before. So in fact, the uh, famously, the, the uh, uh, German sociologist Werner Sommer in 1912 published this, this essay called uh, Why There Is No Socialism in the United States. And it also pointed to the fact that when you have um, on your table, when even you know, uh, working families uh, have on, 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 on their table um, a beef stack of apple pie three times a week, they are, you know, hard to mobilize. They, they, they think uh, less often to the revolution. And, you know, <laughs> the, the Chicolones most probably had uh, uh, beef in Sicily, because they can from Sicily maybe if they're lucky once a month. So the, the difference was very significant. So what the, uh, the immigrants finally did with this newly found, quote unquote, abundance, First, they try to transform what has been the festive diet of their uh, native towns into the everyday. Now they have you know, the opportunity to have this high spacious food uh, like uh, uh, beef, uh, white bread, coffee, sugar, everything that uh, was um, possible to, to purchase on the market was basically incorporated uh, in, um, in their everyday diet. They hybridized a lot because they, as you know, they ended up uh, living uh, most of the time uh, in uh, communities like this, where they, uh, even, even, even this world was heavily fragmented, every block was divided by the Sicilian, uh, the, 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 uh, the Napolitans, and so on and so on. But they interacted a lot, and they exchanged a lot also in terms of the cooking. Uh, because basically what, what they do, what they did uh, is to uh, enrich very significant their, their diet, based, basing that on the memories of, of what the, their fancy cuisine was. Hence uh, the pattern that, uh, for example, is amplified by veal parmigiana or chicken parmigiana. The substitution of, uh, uh, of vegetables with meat. You, you took away eggplant or zucchini and put uh, chicken or, or veal. Uh, and that is you know, one, one, uh, one model. But interestingly, even uh, foods that for the Americans at the time were 100% Italians, like uh, pasta, um, uh, canned tomatoes, olive oil, were, were for most of the immigrants were novelties that they encounter and uh, started to use, again, on an everyday basis when they encountered this kind of uh, market, okay? Because uh, there was an industry, actually, in Italy that growing the world for this very significant and expanding, very much expanding market. But they did also two other things. First, in the South, there was were, were a strong culture that linked um, hospitality most notably the offering of food and wine to a guest with uh, uh, honor and uh, as a factor that gained you and your family significant respect. And on the contrary, if you were not able to offer food to a valued guest, you earn shame. Uh, so in fact, the world anthropologists found uh, examples of family who shook the tablecloths uh, outside the room to pretend that they, they have, uh, um, they have uh, uh, 
the eight uh, uh, mil that never occurred, or rectal pots and pens uh, to, uh, uh, so the, the, family, the family across the street, uh, the neighbors across the street uh, uh, thought that uh, a meal was going on. There was no food in the house. So, uh, with this new uh, availability of food, they were able to reinforce uh, this idea and finally fulfill this old social day. Uh, also, as we have seen talking about the Shikolone and the, the kind of life they have been living, Family networks, family relations, and also community relations were extremely more important uh, uh, in the reality of migration that uh, had always been back home. And so food entered very much in the creation of this, uh, and the creation and reinforcement of very important um, social relations. You need, uh, maybe you never care very much about your uncle back in Sicily, but your uncle here is very important for you to find a job, or your aunt to find you a place to sleep, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, I have the time just to finish with this slide. Unfortunately, again, there are many, many arguments and issues that uh, the book uh, covers. When was the, uh, uh, what was the place where uh, immigrants most immediately, uh, I mean, can appreciate, could appreciate the change, the transformation in their life that this, uh, that quote unquote American food provides to them. Most notably, their body. Okay, just the last digression of the night. Uh, Southern Italia after the, the unification of the country in 1861 and through the, 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 the late 19th century, has been very significantly racialized as an, as an inferior race. Not only but, uh, by North Italian uh, observers and commentators, but even by, by scientists, some, some anthropologists uh, of the late 19th century, uh, brought evidences that uh, the Southern Italian were so short, were so dark, because they were a different race from the Northern Italian, and they were, of course, they were inferior for that. And the food, or the scarcity of food, was uh, brought uh, uh, as another factor in, the, in defining them as an inferior race. So, uh, immigrants overcame very significantly not only the social barriers that, that the food, that the scarcity of food created in Italy, but also the idea of the Russian inferiority. Anyway, as late in 1921, uh, the, the Progressive Italo Americano, the major Italian language paper in New York and the United States, published a mega like this by the Caruso uh, Macaroni, the Caruso Pasta brand, Caruso Spaghetti. So the character on the, the slim character on the left has to be his friend. How could you become so fat in just a few weeks? And he said, of course, I, I eat uh, uh, Caruso spaghetti. <laughs> so he was a, still a fat body, was still a, a, a sign of health and uh, social superiority. Okay? I don't think I have the time to uh, quote from the book uh, a, a description for. Uh, in particular from the Italian journalist uh, that linked this transformation to the idea that the Italian race, even the southern Italian race, was not inferior, was just the, you know, the dietary and climatic uh, um, um, context that uh, determined that. The second point, and I conclude here, always related to this idea of uh, uh, diet and, and race. Um, <coughs> There was another new actor in the food scene in early 20th century America. Uh, apart the food corporation, a lot of new subjects. And it was nutrition science. Nutrition science became actually a full uh, uh, fledged uh, science in the late 19th century. Most of the, uh, some of the findings uh, there was a series of discoveries uh, uh, at a very fast uh, pace in the 20th century, uh, uh, the protein and then the, the different vitamins. Uh, one of the most important applications of nutrition sciences, especially in the cities like New York where there were so many new immigrants, was to 
uh, use the scientific discourse to change uh, the uh, diet of immigrants, most, most notably of uh, immigrants school children that were supposed to be the American citizens of tomorrow, and also to the best uh, means to introduce the right ideas about food and diet into immigrant homes. But those immigrant parents uh, do not speak English and so so. So basically, what happened? Uh, very you know, uh, strong campaign were launched targeting Italian food, Italian immigrant food, as being unhealthy, bad, on, a, on a, so many different counts. Uh, vegetables were cooked uh, too long, for too long, so the nutrients uh, uh, went away with the water. Uh, one pot dishes that passed for joint were terrible because they were digestible. Two spices, so uh, that was conducted to, to uh, too much alcohol drinking, too much coffee, too much sugar. It was all wrong, basically. <laughs> uh, uh, and so this was an important, an important factor in determining um, the sense among the, the children of the immigrants that their, uh, the diet of their parents was uh, a mark of their social inferiority. And in fact, as I explained in the first part of the book, there was nothing natural in the fact that uh, Italian-American food has, has been defined by the immigrants or by the first generation. On the contrary, it was a, a very delicate and complicated work of negotiation of which you will read in the book. Uh, but that meant that for the uh, Italian immigrant children, uh, quote unquote American food was uh, a way, consuming that kind of food was a way to uh, embrace uh, an American uh, identity, also an American idea of citizenship that they felt uh, as very appealing. Milk, uh, for a number of reasons, maybe we can explore it in, in the discussion, was uh, also symbolic of that. Uh, it was very strongly supported uh, as the food that school children had to, had to drink. Uh, and the immigrants had a number of reasons to resist this idea. Anyway, what is this end about? Again, from the progress of Italo Americano, this time in 1935. Here you have the promise, in this particular case, to Italian first and second generation women that by drinking, uh, the most American of the possible of the drinks and the food, you will have the possibility to pass as white. Because the latte per migliorare la sua carne giorni. She drinks milk to improve her complexion. Improving her complexion, that this text very clearly explained, uh, means to become white. And so to uh, enter from a culture and from also from a social point of view, more completely into mainstream American society, the, since uh, race is such an important factor in defining who is in and who is out. I, I gotta stop. Thank you so much. <laughs>
immigration from other countries into Italy. And now in the past maybe three, four years, as a consequence of the recession that has hit Europe, Southern Europe in particular very hard, we have a new wave of migration, very different. Uh, it's not the farmers that migrate now. Are, these are people with doctorates or at least a college degree. While all of this happens, food has become a very important element of uh, discussion about immigration, race, um, and this sort of issues. Uh, for instance, you know, there's been parties in the north that have organized uh, fairs uh, where polenta would be offered, uh, and the posters would say yes to polenta, no to couscous. <laughs> <laughs> and that's become part of, of a discourse that it's quite, um, that, that worries me. Honestly, in the city of Luca, in the center, uh, there was uh, a city regulation that did not allow non-Italian restaurants to open because they would change the atmosphere of the medieval city. It would be important for Italians to read what Italians went through when they left. We've been very quick at forgetting. Uh, maybe that would help Italians to be a little more welcoming. Uh, towards these people that come. We have exactly the same issues. Simone was mentioning the, the question of race. I mean, here in New York it was important, but you can imagine to the Masons working in Norwich, where, you know, there were already Creoles and Italians had a very confusing race identity for most Americans, and they fought hard to become white. And here they are, you know, now in Italy, their descendants probably uh, refusing anybody who doesn't look like them. But now they have to go out again. <laughs> and for me it's very interesting that food becomes really the arena where many of these negotiations happen. Uh, also Italians have a very interesting relationship with Italian-American food. Uh, and I must, you know, personally when I first came here 15 years ago, I was welcomed by my grandmother's sister who had moved here during the Great Depression. So the, the two families had been in contact all the time, but we had not seen each other for 70 years. I was the first one coming back to America. It was a big thing. They organized a huge meal <laughs> of Italian food. Uh, I showed up, and I couldn't make sense of what was on the table, <laughs> <laughs> which created some, some tension. <laughs> but it was, I realized over time it was my problem, because I don't know how I could expect that a family that had lived in another country for such a long time would eat exactly the same stuff I ate. And Italians, as Italians, very often we have this, uh, we are not really able to understand that Italian-American food has become its own tradition, its own gastronomy. Close to ours, we are cousins, we have the same roots, but we developed over now 100 years, along very different paths in very different situations. How could the food be exactly the same? So I sort of resent sometimes the, the attitude that Italians have towards Italian-American food that can be a little like superior, like, I don't know, that's, that's American, that's not what we eat. Again, reading this book would help understanding all the dynamics that really made Italian-American food a very proud and rich uh, tradition in itself, with many connections with Italy, but at the same time with uh, lots of difference. And I want to conclude on something. I, have, uh, I teach next door at the new school, and I have a student in anthropology who's doing research on a community near Bacoli, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, at the coast of Naples, apparently, there is a whole bunch of people who had worked in restaurants here in the US who are opening pizza places in Naples <laughs> where they are presenting Italian American pizza <laughs> as you know something different, something new. And I'm looking forward to reading his work to see. I think that's one of the most interesting uh, aspects of globalization. It's never one direction. It goes in both directions. In many ways, you know, in the book, 
Simone also speaks of the relevance of movies. Uh, the movies from the 30s like Scarface or Little Caesar. Well, those movies had a huge impact in creating ideas of what power should look like, also for Italian. If you see a recent movie, Gomorra, I don't know if any of you have seen it, about Naples, and you see the kids, they are trying to repeat what they see in American movies. I don't know, you have the, the in Naples, the Camorra boss, who has female uh, bodyguards dressed like Uma Thurman in Kill Bill. <laughs> so, I don't know, as Italians, we're really proud of our past, of our traditions, but at the same time, I think it would be important, and these books, I think, have a very important role, not only here, as I repeat, it would be important for people in Italy to read the book, to think in different ways about who we are, about immigration, how identities are global, and how they change, and maybe you know, learning to be a little more relaxed about these things. to take my uh, place at the podium so that I can set up um, my notes and also a little show and tell for you. Simone had asked me um, to speak about Italian food uh, in Italian food as part of New York's history and its present. So I have, uh, I'd like for us to Think about um, what I'm about to say in terms of a uh, panino. Mm -hmm. One uh, slice of bread is um, popular New York food practices today. Uh, the other piece is juxtaposed with Italian New York foodways in the earlier 1900s and they're linked with a rich delicious filling of essential ingredients from times in between. First, I'd like to start out by talking about foraging. Uh, a publication called Ecology Campus Network posted a job description for a professional restaurant forager. They defined a forager as a person who sources and procures locally grown or locally fabricated food for restaurants. They say that it started with Alice Waters and her quest for locally grown food and suppliers. Uh, they go on to say that foraging has become a business and a career. Thousands of North American restaurants now buy from professional foragers. Uh, two NYU graduates have such jobs, Johanna Kolodny from Food Studies, uh, was the forager for print restaurant, and when Annie Myers of Gallatin, uh, be, she received magazine coverage when she became the forager for Spotted Pig and the Breslin Bar and Dining Room. And uh, the magazine article said that when she works, she tries to channel the chef's palate and pick out tastes and specialty ingredients that fit the personality of the restaurant. And she um, also does inventory, costs out recipes, and she researches potential purveyors. Now, um, in how many people, or has anybody here ever gone on a food tour with wild man Stephen Brill? Do you know him? Okay, so he is, his passion is foraging. And he started out, I, I know in the early 1980s, he was leading sort of off the radar tours through city parks, take, telling people how much of the food was edible. And the parks department was really, really nervous about this for <laughs> liability reasons. So they solved it by giving him a job as a park ranger, allowing him to, uh, more professionally forage and bring people through. But at, um, in studying at the Bronx Historical Society, I uh, 
read something interesting about practices that went on at the turn of the century in Franz Siegel Park. Simone, Fabio, what does um, trovera verdura mean? To find vegetables. Yes, you will find vegetables. So uh, in Franz Siegel Park in the Bronx, Italian American women foraged for greens and also for mushrooms. And when they cooked these mushrooms, they knew to drop a silver coin into the cooking pot. If it turned black, that was a sign that they were not safe to eat. Um, also, I think that there's a, is there a, a term for you will find meat? You will find meat. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> trovera. Carne. Carne? OK, well, they did that along, the men did that along the banks of the East River. And I actually have a quick show and tell about how they did that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK, so picture this as a bed spring. We don't have metal bed springs now, but um, in the early 20th to mid 20th century, bed springs were just metal springs on a frame. So they would take a bed spring uh, down, typically discarded, down to the um, river bank. They would take a stick, and this is a piece of grapevine that I cut from my grapevine in my backyard today, Simone. <laughs> OK. They would set the, OK. I actually have the bird seed here. They would scatter the seed underneath, and then they would hide in the bushes, and birds would um, gather under when they would yank the cord and trap the birds. So these were, these were just flying birds in the city. Um, Edible Manhattan, a year ago last spring, had an article on um, eating pigeon now. And um, pigeon, or actually in the restaurant world, it's called squab. And squab is on the per se tasting menu now. <laughs> when my father served it uh, to us for breakfast in the 1960s, he called it Georgia quail. Um, <laughs> but it was pigeon. <laughs> so Simone, uh, in Simone's illustration on his cover, the back of the open uh, home scene shows the tenements, the densely populated tenements. That area of East Harlem was so densely populated that actually some buildings had to be knocked down to create um, an open space. And also there, was, there were a few blocks where there were low density houses that, uh, where it was very popular to go um, promenading through, that it was important to, to go out and and be seen on the street in the air. But even though this urban space was so densely populated, uh, the Italian immigrants still utilized land where it was available for growing food. And as the Metro North train went uptown around 126th Street were squatters gardens right alongside the train tracks. Um, <coughs> A friend of mine uh, from Australia said in the 1970s that in Sydney, when Ita he said, when Italians move here, they tear up the whole front yard and put in a vegetable garden. And now that's, uh, you, you go to NYU around the buildings and the, the landscaper, George Reese, actually plants uh, bright lights, Swiss chard, kale, and now it's used in landscaping. Um, when Italian New Yorkers were able to put down roots with 
an actual home. They did just that. And Michael LaMonaco writes about it in uh, our book that Fabio is part of, Gastropolis. Michael LaMonaco uh, did the foreword to it, and he talks about his backyard that was planted with vegetables, uh, peach tree, fig tree. Um, many of these foods were part of their Sunday dinner and were preserved. And Melissa Clark just did a big article in the Times. Uh, did you read the Times article on figs and fig trees and how their presence in the city uh, is due in large part to Italian immigrants? Also, there's a family in Brooklyn uh, with young sons, and they are selling rooted cuttings of, uh, from fig trees. So um, when I moved to, when I moved from my native Park Slope to Windsor Terrace in 1977, uh, our shopping strip was Prospect Park West, but I quickly learned that I, my shopping strip was actually called Avenue Joe. There was Joe the Butcher, and he's still there at Rocky's. Um, Joe Longobardo at Snow White Dairy would cut the amount of butter that you wanted from the big block in the uh, chilled case behind him. Joe the Shoe Repair would uh, cook his lunch right behind the counter. He took a jar of home canned tomatoes and base it with that had a big pepper, a hot pepper in it, dumped it into a frying pan, heated it up, and ate it with bread, and uh, get, shared some with me. And then there was Joe and Joe, uh, fruit and vegetables, and there's also Joe's Pizzeria. But, and Joe's Pizzeria is still there too. So Joe and Joe's fruit and, fruit and vegetables. Joe, Joe of Joe and Joe taught me how to cook broccoli rob so that it would be more bitter. Um, and this was after I had just started to eat dandelion greens, which I nicknamed penance greens because they were so bitter. So here he's telling me how to make them more bitter. And now I, I utilize those strategies. His wife sent lunch up to him at the store daily and he shared with me the stuffed mussels. The shells were closed with feet and feet of sewing uh, thread. And he also taught me how to eat sea urchin raw. Um, Joe of Joe and Joe also helped the neighborhood uh, every August on the sidewalk outside. He had crates and crates of Roma tomatoes. And the Italian neighbors set up their sauce making. In their driveways, they put long tables with the tomato grinders, and the doors were open so that the ground tomatoes could go into the back to be made into sauce. Where? In the gravy kitchen, okay? The second kitchen, the one downstairs that's close to the backyard, so you can have a little bit of cooling, and that's where you do the big hot cooking of the sauces. And when Jonathan Deutsch, my co-editor in Gastropolis, bought his house in uh, Marine Park, one of the selling points listed in the real estate ad was, has gravy kitchen. <laughs> Okay. Um, also, okay, there is the importance of um, the, the family meal. We, we learn or we're, we're reminded often about the value of the family meal. Uh, Lynn Fredericks has been advocating on behalf of it for decades. People connect over food. There is a familymeal.com project. Uh, my, one of my NYU methodology professors here, Joe Jaquinta, 
when he was a student at NYU, he was required to return to his family home in Brooklyn every Sunday afternoon for the three o'clock meal. And he talks about uh, how walking close to his house, he could smell the unique or specific to each family's home cook, the aroma of the different gravies mm -hmm. until he came to his own at home. Uh, so ending with that, Joe, I thank you. <laughs> Well, what was described today is basically what I've lived my whole life, talking about a fig tree in the yard, talking about a peach tree, growing tomatoes. In fact, I lived around the corner from Michael Monica, a good friend of mine. In Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, we weren't always there. My family first immigrated from Basilica to Italy in 1903, my great-grandfather. Savino Di Paolo. When he arrived in New York City, settled in on Mott Street in Little Italy, a section where he was familiar with because that block, Mott Street, as was mentioned by Simone before, was segregated. It was segregated for only Italians from the Basilicata and Puglia area. If you were from Mulberry Street, if you lived on Mulberry Street, you were only from Campania, or the, the Neapolitans, as they would call themselves. And if you were on Elizabeth Street, you better be a, a Sicilian. <laughs> because you, you didn't belong unless you were Sicilian on Elizabeth Street. My great-grandfather left his family behind, his wife and his four children, and came here and settled. And it wasn't until 1910 when he was able to afford to open up his own small lotteria. He was a farmer, and I was fortunate enough to visit my great-grandfather, who's been dead since 1939, this past June, in the mountain town of Basilicata. And what do I mean by that? I met a farmer, a farmer that still milked the cows by hand, a farmer that took the milk brought it into a little grotto, which was his caseficio, or his, his dairy where he made his cheese, built a wooden fire, heated the milk, made his cheese. He didn't know that I was a cheese maker as well, so I started to make cheese with him. I made the cacio cavallo, and I made what we call a treccia, which is a twisted pasta filata, or a twisted type of mozzarella cheese. He looked at me and he said to me, in a language that I could barely understand because it was really mountain dialect, I remember hearing that language because that's the way my great aunts used to speak. He said, tonight you eat in my house. And it was not until 1914 where my great grandfather had enough money to bring his family over. And family was very important because he needed that help to work if you know what I mean, that free labor. But it wasn't really free, because his attitude was he brought his family to have a better life, living in the hills of Basilicata, a very difficult terrain, and being under the influence of nobles that felt that these peasant farmers were inferior. By all means, they were inferior, <coughs> low educated, he felt that this was the land that he would give them an opportunity to grow and get their own uh, true uh, aspirations to develop. And it was a very difficult time for Italians to be in America, as was mentioned. My name is Luigi, and I don't want to say I was ashamed of my name, but I was embarrassed. For years, I went under the name of Lewis. Why? Because literally, to being called Luigi in school during my era was being laughed at. 
And I was named after my grandfather, Luigi. And my father was named after his grandfather, Savino. So when it came time for my son to name my son, as the tradition of the, the Italians to name their first son after their father, I did not have the courage to name my son Savino. So I named him the nickname that everybody called my father, which was Sam. And I said I didn't want to give the stigma of an Italian name to my son. So what happens? My son was about 16 years old. I get a phone call one day, and, and who's on the phone? A young girl. She says, can I speak to Savino, please? <laughs> I said, Savino doesn't live here. That's my father. So no, he can't be. He's a young boy. And my son comes up, hears me with this conversation, grabs the phone, starts talking to this girl, hangs up the phone and looks at me right in the face. Why didn't you name me Savino? <laughs> and it was then when I realized how times and things have changed. In our family, Italian, was, Italian dialect was spoken, but wasn't spoken to us. We were meant to be American, to leave ourselves of the Italian stigma, so to speak. But my life was always centered around being Italian because our business was geared to the Italian community. And the Italian that I know today is Italian that I've learned through my business and through the many travels to Italy. By no means is it proper Italian. I refer to it as Italo American. <laughs> what, what we decided in our family, my sister Marie, my brother, myself, was to give our children an opportunity to reclaim their Italian heritage to understand what it is to be of Italian heritage. And we gave them the opportunity all to go to Italy, to stay there, to study, to learn the language, and to understand what it is to be an Italian. Food is a very important part of our upbringing. Talking about our Sunday meal, now our business is open seven days a week. But come Sunday, as I was growing up, my father and my uncle made a point of closing that business at one o'clock so that they would be able to go home and have their Sunday family meal with their family. As years went on, and as we became more American, Sunday meal, I want to go to the movies on Sunday. So we took the opportunity of not having this big meal, as my as the grandparents passed away, because you know you had to go to the matriarch's home on Sunday, and we started to lose that. Now, with my grandchildren, we are looking to reclaim that, to understand how important it is to get the families together, cousins together, sitting down at a family meal, talking about things, arguing about something else, and then kissing and saying, I'll see you next week. So very, very important. What happened to the food, the Italian food in America? Well, what is American food? What really is American food? American food is a collage of many cultural foods brought here and adapted, adapted to the American way of life. For instance, spaghetti and meatballs. Why do we have spaghetti and meatballs? There's certainly no spaghetti and meatballs. In, in Italy, there's polpetta. It's to understand why we have spaghetti and meatballs. It's because my grandparents and great-grandparents were not able to possibly support a full meal of meat on a regular basis, as you mentioned before. And on a Sunday, what would you have? A Sunday ragu, call it gravy. What is gravy? What's the difference between gravy and a sauce? A gravy is something with rendered meat in it. 
and a ragu is what we made every Sunday. And what was in the ragu? Bones, uh, the toughest meat made into what we call brajole. Polpetta, meatballs, meatballs that were probably the poorest quality meat, seasoned with a lot of spices, a lot of garlic, and we don't have that much garlic in Italy, a hint of garlic in Italy. Over here, you go to any red sauce Italian restaurant, and what do you taste? You taste garlic. But why? To counter the flavors of the meat that probably wasn't that good. And then it was cooked for hours, hours and hours, in a, in a tomato sauce, rendering all the juices of the meat and making the tough meat tender, the meat coming off those bones, very, very tender. It was the best, best ragu you could imagine. <laughs> My mission has been, in the last 30 years, while I continued the business I'm the fourth generation in my business, in the Italian food business, was to understand what truly is Italian food. I'm very proud of Italian American food. It's comfort food to me. It invokes memory of my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, my cousins, my sisters, and my brother. Sitting around the table, it invokes memory, and it's very important to me. But I needed to know what really was Italian food and what was truly Italian ingredients. And my mission was to go and rediscover the true art of Italian cuisine. To bring it back to America, never losing sight that I'm an American first and I enjoy American food but also trying to give to the American consumer a true understanding of what Italian food is and what Italian American food is. I haven't read a book in over a year. This is the first book I've read in, in a year. And I, and the reason why is, is because I just finished mine and I didn't want to be influenced with any other book. And I read this book and I read and I saw Again, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, and what I grew up with. So it was very, very enlightening for me to see someone putting it down to tell my story, because that's what you did, my family story. And talking about the backyard in Brooklyn, because right after World War II, my grandmother, was, my grandfather was ill, and wasn't able to walk up the five flights of stairs in the old tenement buildings that they lived on a fusion block, Eldridge Street. Because as it, the Italian population started to grow in Little Italy, it sort of blended with the Ashkenazian and Eastern Sephardic Jewish community. And there was no more room on Mott Street to live, so they managed to get a place on Eldridge Street. So my grandmother bought a home in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And that's where she had her fig tree. She had her tomatoes. She grew her string beans. And of course, her zucchini. <laughs> and there was always, on the little patch of, land, of, of turret that wasn't used, mint growing. They were very big and growing mint, for whatever reason. <laughs> I never remember them cooking with it. I only remember them picking it and, and chewing on it like we would chew a piece of gum. The mint has its own mind. It, it just goes wild. Once they started, it went all, it went all along the cracks of every little vacant space. But this is a very um, a rewarding experience for me to read your book. And I have to appreciate and thank you for it. Thank you. But people are happy that uh, this book resonates to you and your memories uh, as something that 
that represent that kind of, that kind of experience. Uh, thank you, of course, to all of you, uh, Fabio, Annie, and Lou, for your uh, for your comments. I think we can take uh, some questions now uh, from the audience, from any of us. Wonderful program. Uh, it just reminded me that my uh, uh, grandfather grew up in Harlem, and his uh, father, Eustachio Matamucci, used to send him into Central Park to pick uh, dandelions. Uh, yeah. Um, movies. I'm thinking about movies uh, in food. Uh, Italian food. What comes to mind for me? The Godfather. Lots of great scenes with food. Um, uh, Saturday Night Fever. There's some wonderful scenes at the table. But I think my favorite uh, Italian food uh, eating movie has to be Moonstruck. Yeah. When you have the final scene where Cher has to tell her boyfriend, Daddy Ayala, that she's not going to marry him. She's going to marry uh, his brother instead. But it has to be told at the table around the family, right? Um, just a quick anecdote. I live in Hoboken, and there's a lot of Italian people in Hoboken. And there used to be a restaurant called Tutta Pasta on 3rd and, and Washington Street. And from the sidewalk, you could look inside, a big window. And Danny Aiello used to love to go there. And he would always be sitting around with a group of about like 10 other, usually guys, you know. And I loved to see him in there because it was so like passionate, engaged. And it was like this, this atmosphere of, of, of just being around food and friends. and. Uh, but I guess knowing from the movie Moonstruck, too, having that image, I would see it from the sidewalk, and it was like art and life overlapping. And I always felt, made me feel cheerful whenever I saw Dan Ayala and his cronies hanging out, you know, with, with the food. So do you, do you have any anecdotes about particular movies or uh, <laughs> culture, and food, Italian food? Maybe Fabio is the expert. Fabio is the person, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> For me, the, the movie that I use a lot in, in, in my classes, I teach a, a course on film and film. Uh, I have my students watch uh, Good Fellows. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's very complicated, and that's why I have them watch. Because it's, in a way, it's full of stereotypes. But on the other side, you see the role that Italian food can, can play. And for me, it's also very important to have students see how food plays a different role in Italian-American movies and in Italian movies already, I don't know, in the 40s, in the 50s. And actually, I, I heard an interview with Martin Scorsese who spoke uh, about the time when you know, the neorealist movies started being shown on American TV and what it meant for them to see Italy after the war with the destruction, the poverty, and the realization that they were living a very different life. So in a way, I like working on, on movies because they allow a sort of conversation going on between you know, Italy and the other Italys uh, all over the place. And if you learn how to look through movies, I think there is a lot you can get out of it. Just a, a comment about immigrant culture. My grandmother came from Lithuania, and she settled in the sake New Jersey, which had a lot of Italians, and how people learn from one another. In her garden, she grew Italian plum tomatoes, something called gagoots. We <laughs> <laughs> had tons and tons of gagoots with uh, 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 a stew with the tomatoes and fresh made foods. And she made better Italian uh, food as, as, as a Lithuanian and then with great cheese and cheese to get from the Italian dog, you know, and, and she made her own bread. So that's how they all learn from, from one another.
I, I don't uh, know how to make comments from this, but maybe you will. There, uh, a movie that specifically was about red sauce Italian American, in a sense, called Big Night. And I'm amazed that nobody has mentioned it. I, I, I don't want to say any more about it than that, but it was, it was uh, it used red sauce Italian as a foil. Uh, or target. No, I, I think Big Night, uh, uh, of course, is very important. Uh, and also, uh, talking about the, the continuous circulation across the Atlantic of foods, people, ideas about food that also you mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, it's interesting that uh, I, I uh, uh, quote uh, three or four um, uh, memories of middle class Italian travelers that would travel in the 1920s and 30s here to New York and ate uh, in Italian immigrant homes or, or in Italian restaurants here and found the same food that the immigrants uh, uh, found so tasteful and, and delightful and nutritious, horrible, uh, <laughs> too greasy, too spicy. Uh, and that was uh, you know, the sign for them, these middle class travelers, of the lack of taste of the immigrants. And, and I think this is the first example uh, you know, of, of the, the divarication of the two food patterns um, that uh, goes on and on until uh, uh, in the 1970s, where uh, some cookbook authors and then uh, uh, TV show host, Marcella Zan and then uh, Lydia Bastianic and so on and so forth, uh, took as their mission to teach Americans what real Italian food was, the food that Italians in Italy ate, right? And so they said, look, to these middle class Americans who were their, 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 their target, said, what you know about Italian food, the red sauce cuisine, the garlic, uh, what you mentioned before, is wrong. It's not what uh, you, you are supposed to think about in Italian. And I think uh, Big Night is at the end of this, uh, of this circle because the hero of the story is the, is the uh, secondo, the chef, uh, that primo, sorry, primo, the chef who refuses to serve the Italian, his, his Italian customers uh, the, what they think is Italian food is completely wrong. This is set in 1950 in New Jersey, so he is ahead of his time, and so he's, nobody under, uh, understood him. And, and the, the, the restaurant in front will serve you know, the uh, uh, cheap uh, Italian food is, is very much successful. So the fact that, uh, I think that the, the, the movie uh, was made in 1996, 1998, something like that, the fact that the hero of the story is uh, this uh, purveyor of the authentic Italian cuisine uh, uh, make the, the, the circle close. Now, we know what uh, uh, is supposed to be real authentic Italian food, or uh, at least the spectators of the movie uh, like to, to think so. <laughs> I'd like to make just a, a comment about that uh, real Italian food, something as simple as pizza. Uh, I, I remember, so, and so often this happens, I get people that have traveled to Italy for the first time and they went and they ordered a pizza and they said, I'll have a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and when they get the, and the, and the uh, waiter in Italy looks at them and says, you want a pepperoni pizza? Okay. And he comes out with a pizza with peppers on it. <laughs> and they said, imagine that, and they don't even know what a pepperoni pizza is all about. <laughs> well, that's when I have to tell them what pepperoni in America, and where, who made it first, and what it was all about. It was a German company that invented the meat pepperoni to capture some of the Italian immigrant market, making a spicy sausage type, and sort of combined a German attitude of, of sausage, slightly smoked, with some hot spicy peppers in it. And they said, what are we going to call it? Well, that's what's the name for peppers in Italian? So we call it pepperoni. So this is the problem that um, even even American Italians who have grown up eating pepperoni, never knowing what pepperoni really is. If, uh, I just want to say something about um, signage on Italian food stores in the neighborhoods that. Um, are illustrated in Simone's book and just in walking around New York. If you go, 
there, you know, neighborhoods used to be much more culturally demarcated than they are now. You, you could go to different neighborhoods to shop for different ethnic food specialties, which is the way that um, I was raised. When we weren't growing or gathering the food, we were going to the direct purveyors. But um, in going to the Italian neighborhoods, at the Salu Maria, did I? Is, a, is, is the delicatessen. Oh, well, then what, the butcher shop? They had on the signs, Jersey Pork Store. And that is from uh, the Secaucus Pig Farms. It, where the meadowlands are is marshland where pigs were raised and brought right across the river. So that's a pretty, yeah, exactly, I know. Um, Espositos, they still have the sign, right? Um, so that's, that's pretty local, and here we are now. Uh, the locavore diet is, is, is in the common language. Uh, yeah, we, we have time for the, a nice question. <laughs> we told you that um, we have to close. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this was extremely, extremely interesting. Thank you all. I write particularly and think particularly about fusion, which has gone on forever, of course, ever since there were two countries and a border. Um, and what I'm finding very interesting about this is the fusion that occurs between the immigrant and the home country, which I've also thought about a lot and what Fabio was saying before about um, the American girls, was it, who were making American pizza, American. Um, I was reminded, this happens very frequently, the bringing back from here of something that's Americanized or that's been commercially successful. Um, I know Greeks who have started using balsamic vinegar in Greece, who have started using basil, which is not a Greek herb, because it's been extremely successful here. And I was also reminded while listening to this of um, a wonderful Italian woman I knew who was very embarrassed about the fact that she lived here and she had come to drink cappuccino in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and I just heard about a new pizzeria, I don't know who the owners are, um, that opened, I think, on Hudson Street, where the owner it's where you dig your feet in about fusion and things like this, is refusing to serve cappuccino because you wouldn't have it in a pizzeria in Italy. So there's so much to say. I'm not going to say it because you need to close. But the entire subject and the way you presented it was really wonderful. And I thank you all. Thank you for leaving so much to all the commentators, to all of you to be here on Wednesday night. Uh, there's one last moment of the night, uh, uh, sort of important book sale, <laughs> <laughs> book signing upstairs. Again, uh, thank you.